Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Little, hope you're having a fantastic day. If you are here, please let me know. So let's take a look at your question for today. Can you show us some interesting hands you played recently? Sure, it's nice and easy for me to do. Um, let's take a look, here we have Hold'em Manager. I've been playing every Sunday for I think the last two months, I think we put in eight sessions. I think we're up about 15 or 20,000 bucks. You know, it's actually kind of hard to keep track of, it doesn't really matter to be fair. What we really care about though is the all-in adjusted big blind per hundred number. If you don't know about heads up displays, check out pokercoaching.com slash HUD, H-U-D. There you can get my heads up display for free. You have to pay for hold manager, but you can get the heads up display settings for free. And um, that'll be useful, good and useful for you. And you'll understand what all these stats mean. We're not gonna spend too much time on that today. But anyway, you just want this number to be positive. If you're playing high stakes, playing a lot of tables, like we are, anything above five is just great. And I mean, I'm playing literally every game, $30 and buy it, $30 buying and higher on the site. And um, we're crushing them. Like I said, we're up to like 15 or 20K. Again, you have to realize like, does, is that good for four, for eight sessions? I mean, I guess it is in theory. If you told me it'd be up, uh, what, 2,500 a session or something like that, I guess I'd sign. But realize that like one day's worth of volume is like 2,500 bucks, or I'm sorry, $12,000 or $15,000. So if one day's worth of buys is, uh, $15,000, we're actually just up one session. So, you know, we're gonna go on downswings where we just get completely crushed. I mean, to be fair, last week, I was just getting completely crushed until we ran hot in the, in the 1K at the end of the day. Um, this this week, same story, right? We bubbled two satellites yesterday, which, you know, we could have ran a little bit hotter in. We'd be up an extra $5,000, which would clearly be nice. Um, we took ninth place in the $1,000 tournament, which, you know, if we ran a little bit higher, we would've won 64K. We had a big, big all-in coin flip to give us the chip lead with nine left. It was unfortunate. Under the gun raise, I ripped it in with the ace king. Somebody cold called the second, the, the chip leader cold called with uh, queens, and I lost the flip. So you need to win those flips. Could have won a bunch there. So anyway, we've had some good shots to be up a lot, but it has not panned out, and that's okay. Anyway, all you care about is EV big blind per hundred. If it's above like five or six, you're probably in the right games for you. If your EV big blind per hundred is like nine or ten, which it very easily could be in the smaller medium stakes games, then you should probably move up. Actually. So anyway, let's take a look at some hands. I have a bunch of hands marked. There's a chance I've, you've seen some of these hands if you've watched other stuff I've done, but we'll just go through these. We'll go through these for, I don't know, 30, 45 minutes, something like that. Here we have pocket jacks. We open it up. I don't actually remember any of these hands, so we'll see what happens. I open up with jacks, get called, get called, and then get three bet. And when I'm going through these hands, don't just like watch and observe. Don't sit back and have a beer and, and you know, relax. Ask yourself at every point, hmm, what would I do here? and try to go kind of quickly. That kind of thing is relatively good for helping you autopilot and just learn to play many, many tables at a time. To be fair, whenever I'm playing all these games, we are playing you know, 15, 14, 13, 14, 15 tables at a time. And you have to go kind of quick. You need to be snappy when it comes to making good decisions. That said, if you're newish to the game, then you know, speed is not your main concern. Your main concern is just making good decisions. So anyway, this heads up display stats we care about the most are V, P, steal, fold be blind to steal, three bet, fold to three bet. These are the ones we care about the most. 25, 16 is actually pretty reasonable. 8% three bet's kind of tight. So when this guy three bet's out of position, you have to think he's kind of tight. So in this scenario, I think we would normally like to just rip it all in if the opponent was kind of loose and aggressive. Like if his three bet was a little bit higher, like perhaps, I don't know, 12, 10, something like that, then I, I think I would just rip it in. But when it's eight, or lower, especially. I think we do just want to call. Remember this, this was actually on a bubble, I think in a thousand dollar buy-in tournament. So you know, substantial spot that we don't really want to just blast it in. And if this is on a bubble, this guy's kind of incentivized to be even a little bit tighter given he's three betting into the chip leader who could crush him. So I think this is just a call. We do just call, everybody calls. Queen six, three, guy goes all in, easy fold now. Even if he checked, I would have just still check folded this flop if somebody bet. Yes, we are gonna get bluffed off the best hand some portion of the time, but the vast majority of the time, somebody's gonna have a queen here and I'm dead against a queen. So anyway, we fold. Pocket twos, facing a min raise, easy call preflop. Whenever you're in the big blind closing the action, you need to call very, very wide and small pairs are great. If this guy was substantially looser, I would definitely consider ripping it all in. Now twos are not great. They're not a good hand to shove with because they don't block any Thing at all. They're like anti-blockers, if anything, right? So it means the opponent's more likely to have a good big card hand. Um, so we're usually just flat calling here. So this is a spot where we are going to flat call, flop a set, which is great. Easy check call on the flop. There's no reason to raise. So um, 
in this situation, if we raise, the opponent's going to fold out all of their garbage. And the opponent will have some garbage, like say he has Queen Jack of Diamonds, right? I really want the guy to stand with Queen Jack of Diamonds. Yes, we're susceptible to getting outdrawn by like Ace-5 or two spades, but the odds of any of those particular hands is somewhat low. Obviously, there are a lot of hands that they could have, but I think most of the time in this scenario, the opponent either has an overpair, which we're going to stack anyway, or he has unpaired overcards that are dead, right? And when the opponent's dead, you don't really want to give them the opportunity to fold. So we just call. Turns nine of spades. We check. Opponent bets again. Interesting bet where the guy goes very small. At this point, if he has random overcards, they have a spade a decent amount of the time. If we can get the opponent to fold any spades or put all of his money in with a spade, either of those is a good success. If he does have an overpair, I want to stack him before a spade comes. Like say he has jack of diamonds, jack of hearts. He'll definitely put his money in on the turn, but he'll check, check if a spade comes. So this is a situation where we um, we just need to go ahead and shove at this point. If the guy went all in on the turn, obviously we call. So we do get it in. He folds. Alan asked on the previous hand, are we getting the right odds to set mine? Oh, we're not just straight set mining. This is something I think a lot of people do wrong. They think, oh, I'm only continuing if I get a set. What's going to happen most of the time here is these two players are going to fold. And then we're in a heads-up pot in position with jacks, which went on their own merit a decent amount of the time. If we, like, if it came... Well, to be fair, when he goes four ways, if it comes low cards and the guy goes all in, we're still just going to fold because it's too likely someone yet to act has something or the jammer has something. But if this is a heads-up pot and we get a reasonable flop with undercards, we just pay the guy off because we beat ace-king, we beat ace-queen, and we beat all the bluffs, right? So we're not straight set mining. If it was a smaller pair like sevens, do we fold? Um, yeah, we fold sevens. I think I probably fold like nines and lower here. Assuming it's the bubble, assuming I think the opponent's incentivized to be tight, I would make bigger folds in this scenario. Do your best to type in your questions quickly. That way we're not going back and forth. Otherwise, we won't get through any hands. Raise the two big blinds under the gun from a loose guy. What do we do with the ace-five suited? What do you think? Take a second. Think about it. We have eight big blinds against an under-the-gun raise from a loose player. Let's pull out equal app here. How does ace-five suited do against a loose-ish under-the-gun raising range? Let's see. We have... Ace of spades, five of spades. What does a loose under-the-gun raising range look like? Again, ask yourself, what would you do in this scenario? Remember, I think this guy's loose, so we're going to give him just like a ridiculous range that he never has. So if he's just ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous, let's say he does this number, okay? This would be ridiculous. You see we are behind. So if the opponent's ridiculous, we're behind. We obviously have no fold equity because he's always going to be getting the right price to call. So if he's absurd... We're behind. What about if he's slightly more reasonable? Still still silly, but slightly more reasonable. Well, now, even a little bit more behind. What if he's actually just raising good hands from under the gun? Which, you know, some people will. A lot of people don't get too out of line from under the gun because, well, you can't if you expect to win any money. He's probably going to raise maybe something like this. So how do we do against this? Well, we're decently far behind. So given we have basically no fold equity because the opponent has to put in six to win... 16, 17, 18, 19. Six to win 19, you used to have 33% equity. Obviously, will with basically everything. Um, given we have no fold equity, we're essentially calling it off with the ace five suited. And you don't want to call it off with the ace five suited when you're just straight up behind. And you may say, but isn't there a little bit of dead money in the pot? Yeah, a little bit, but not a lot. Um, in this scenario, if I think I have, well, let's just go over here. What, what was our equity against a reasonable range? 42%. Let's get out the calculator. We have to put in eight to win a total of our eight, our opponent's eight, small blind, big blind, anti. So 16, 17, 18.5. Where'd the calculator go? Just died on me. Eight divided by 18.5. 0. 0.5 equals. So we need to have 43% equity. Assuming we're always heads up. And I'm showing you right here, it's going to be way closer to like 42%. So essentially we're just putting it in breaking even. And you don't really want to just put it in breaking even. You'd rather profit, right? And I already showed you that even if the guy is just a lunatic, we're, we're, yeah, we're getting it in the head, but we're not loving it. Also, you have to account for the fact that some of these players you have to act are going to wake up with premium hands sometimes and then just crush us, right? So this is a spot where we have a very, very easy fold. So what do we get it all in here with? Well, we want to have hands that have like 48, 47% equity against this range. So what you can do is you can go to Tools, Hand Range Calculator, and you can tell it you want to have 47% equity, something like that, right? Because you want to have a little bit of an edge, even with your eight big blind stack. And this is now what you should get it all in with. You should get it all in with this range only. Nitty, I know, right? 
But if we want to have 47%, because we don't exactly know the opponent's range, but it's probably reasonable. I mean, I know he's on the looser side, but he's probably reasonable. And we have to worry about players yet to act. Given all of that combined, this is all we can actually get it in with here. Now, to be fair, I'd get it in a little bit looser than this. In reality, what do I go with? Probably like this. But notice, that's not a whole lot looser. I think a lot of people make the mistake with a very shallow stack of thinking, all right, I'm just going to pop it in because what else am I going to do? But especially if you're playing deep in a tournament where you're in the money already or kind of nearing the money bubble, you definitely, definitely don't want to just get it in too light here. So this is an easy fold. A lot of people screw that up, though. I remember when I was streaming, everybody was like, oh my god, why wouldn't you go all in? You don't have any chips. Well, because I have no fold equity. Now, fun enough, <laughs> here we have a spot where we do have fold equity. In this scenario, you got to think the initial raiser's opening more than only the nuts. You see, get there is, you know, reasonably tight, but at the same time has a load of chips. Big People with a lot of chips tend to splash around a little bit more, especially on the button. So this is a scenario where I think we have a pretty easy all-in. Because now... In this spot, compared to the previous spot, we have a lot of fold equity. So in this scenario, I think we can jam quite wide. And I think that's going to be very, very good. I think, I mean, obviously get there is going to call sometimes if he has something like ace-queen, ace-jack, ace-ten, maybe king-queen suited. Obviously, if he has a good hand, he's going to call like queens or something. But I, th I think this is a pretty nice shove. The thing is, even if he does call off with ace queen or pocket nines it's it's not a big deal like yeah you don't like it you'd rather the guy fold but we're gonna have a decent amount of fold equity here so i think this is a pretty reasonable all-in shove spot initial guy folds which is always good and we get called which is not good we make trip so that's good we're gonna win he has the ace nine right so we get called by a fair flip i don't actually like the call here because um well, what do we think my actual jamming range is in this scenario it's tough to say I think we're looking at something like this, maybe. Notice we're in the small blind, so we get to flat call some of this stuff. Like, I don't think I really want to jam queen jack suited, queen 10 suited, king 10 suited. Don't really want to jam these. I'd rather just flat call all the suited connected stuff. Do I jam any pair? Probably. Do I jam queen jack off suited? I'd probably just fold that, but I could get behind jamming it too. Sure, something like that. If you look at a GTO solver, very often it does do something like this as well, where it flats a lot of this good suited connected stuff and it just rips it in with the offsuit garbage. So I'm probably jamming something like this. So how does ace nine suited do against this range? Ace nine suited. You see he's, um, you know, roughly breaking even, which is not really where he wants to be. If we're near the bubble, is it better to just fold? Uh, yeah, definitely, because then this heffalump character should be tighter as well. So if Heffalump it has to be tighter because we're on the bubble, his raising range should be tighter, which means we're going to have less fold equity, presumably, because his opening range should be tighter. If we're already in the money, though, or if we're nowhere near the money, I think this is a, just a standard shove. Jack-10 suited. Raise, call, call. Here's a good example of the spot, right, where uh, maybe we have some fold equity, but this hand just flops great. And when the hand flops great, you really want to see the flop. So... I don't mind calling here. I think shoving could also be fine. Here, if we do shove, it's nice because there's always going to be five dead big blinds in the pot. But notice, like, if there's five dead big blinds in the pot, the pot will be a total of 45, right? Our, I'm sorry, 35. Our 15, our opponent's 15. I guess we have 16. 16 times 2 is, uh, what? God, I can't do math. It's so early for me. 16 times 2 equals 32. Plus 5 equals 37. So we have to put in how many more? 15 to win 37. So that means we need to win 40-ish percent of the time, which, you know, Jack-10 suit is good, but is it all that good against a calling range? I'm not actually sure. Take a look, right? How do we do against a reasonable calling range? Reasonable calling range is going to be something like this. Obviously, the last guy is going to call us decently wider. It's going to be something like this for most of the people, though. 15 big blinds. They probably call off eh, something like this, maybe. Who knows what it actually is. But as you see, we actually are decently far behind. So yes, we have some fold equity, but when we get called, we're actually kind of unhappy here. And I think we'd rather just call and go from there. Knowing when to squeeze versus flat is tricky for you. Well, when you're closing the action, you should be more inclined to flat because you're closing the action. You're not going to get jammed, right? So the previous hand, I was in the small blind. So when you're in the small blind, you definitely want to be more inclined to shove. If I was in the small blind here, I'd probably shove against the raise in the call. I, I think that's probably going to be a little bit better. But closing the action in the big blind, you should be very inclined to just flat. 
we had Jack 10 offsuit will be flat. Yeah, I'm not going to be squeezing this t spot a ton because I don't think we have a lot of fold equity. We have some, but not a lot. But notice this guy is very tight, right? 13 slash 10 is especially tight. Always make sure you're paying attention to the heads up stats. And against the 13 10 guy, you really don't want to be squeezing because his range should be pretty good. And if his range is pretty good, it means you lack fold equity. So I'm really not squeezing here. I'm just going straight linear, like just really good stuff. Um, I'm actually probably squeezing something, something that looks like this, maybe. Yeah, something like this. This this looks nice to me. Maybe I jam all the pairs. I don't even love jamming small pairs though, really. So I think I think I would jam something like this. Just a good strong linear range. Flop a straight draw. I would probably end up check calling a small bet here. If someone goes all in, I'll fold. Hmm. Yeah, so probably probably play cautiously here. It's very easy to be against an ace, and you very definitely lack fold equity. And if somebody bets, they're not going to fold out any draw, and you lose to a lot of the draws that make logical sense. So I think we have to play cautiously here. Check, 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 though. That's good. Turns a jack. That gives us a better hand. We'll just keep checking, though. If we bet now and get called, we definitely do not like it. But I check jam 982. Yes, because then our opponents can be betting with some weaker made hands they may fold, depending on their size. Also... We have more equity, right? Like on, on ace-9-8, we have to drill a straight to win if the opponent has an ace. Whereas on 9-8 brick, a jack or a 10 wins some portion of the time. Anyway, check, check, check. River queen. We have a straight. Checks me. What do you think? How do you feel about this one? Well, if I bet what's going to call me, given we're very multi-way, given I don't actually have a whole lot of chips, given I have virtually no bluffs in my range because it's very easy for both the players yet to act to have a 10. What am I trying to get called by? I mean, I'm trying to get superhero called. Interestingly enough, I can actually be beat here too. Notice I lose to backdoor flushes and I lose to the random king 10, which certainly does make some sense for the opponents. They'd raise preflop with king 10. They'd give up on the flop. They don't have to bluff the turn. Then here they are on the river. Obviously I block it. It's not super likely, but it is a real hand they could have. So I think we need to check. And if we do face a bet, I think it's also just a check call. This is a spot where people really overplay this multi-way. Because when you do bet and get called, you don't actually love it. I mean, it's fine. It's fine. I mean, you win. You win a lot of time when you do get called or you're chopping. But you'd much rather just check and induce bluffs and or overvalues and just protect your stack. Because if we check here, usually they're not going to be overbetting too often. I mean, they could. It's probably not a bad play here if they have a flush or the king 10. But if they do bet like five big blinds and we happen to be beat, notice we end up saving eight big blinds and... I think a lot of people don't value this eight big blind remaining stack. It's like, yeah, it's not great, but eight, you'd rather have eight than zero. So check, check, check this time. Let's see what they have. There's a feature here you can show hand results. And, um, you know, they'll have nothing. But did jam preflop. This guy probably would have ended up calling me and we would have flipped, which is not especially ideal. It's not, not terrible, but it's not ideal. Aces, that's good. Raise, call, always three bet. We'll make it about 10 or 11 big blinds, given we're very, very deep. Is what we do. They both call. Ace, queen, 10. Do we slow play? If you looked at the GTO solver a whole lot, you'll see it really enjoys slow playing top set sometimes. The times it likes slow playing the top set is when it's not really susceptible to being outdrawn at all. But um, that's not where we are here. Notice any king is terrible, any jack is terrible, but also more importantly, there's this idea of range connectivity and that is how well does the opponent's ranges connect with this board? And in this spot, they nail this board, right? They're going to have all sorts of um, top pairs, middle pairs, etc. So we just want to bet here and get money in the pot. We want to bet kind of big because if they have an ace, they're not going to fold. If they have a queen, it's going to be king, queen, or queen, jack. They're not going to fold. If they have a 10, it's going to be king, 10, or jack, 10, maybe 10, 9, I guess. But they're not going to fold. So we want to be going something like 20 big blinds here and just try to get money in the pot. Turns a queen, which is great. And now the opponent leads. We're betting big because we're deep stacked, right? Yes, correct. If we were shallower, I'd be betting a little bit less. But when we're deep, we want to build the pot and make the pot big. We want the pot to be big when we have the nuts. When we're deep stacked, so we can get all the money in by the river. And I was going to bet big on the turn and blast the river all in. Even if it came blank, blank, unless it came exactly a jack or a 10, we will be putting all of our money in. Now the guy leads into me on the ace. This is definitely a spot to call because whatever this guy has is drawing dead, right? If we raise and he is bluffing randomly with like jack 10 or something, we let him fold. If he does have a queen, we're going to stack him anyway. I mean, I guess there's an off chance if he has, I don't know, queen nine or something. If it comes a king or a ten, we don't stack. Or king or a jack, we don't stack him. But that's that's very unlikely. This is going to be a whole lot of weird bluffs. 
like backdoor diamond draws, like weird backdoor diamond draws, like jack nine of diamonds or something. And um, queens. So we basically always stack the queens and the bluffs are drawing dead. And I want to do everything I can to make the opponent think we have something like ace-king here, which may fold river. Hey, jack nine of diamonds gets there. He jams. So we fold now the jack, jack nine of diamonds gets there. Definitely a hand he could have. He could show me four of them, four queens. Seems to be a lot of quads on this poker site. Easy call. Easy, 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 easy call. Don't fold. Horribly played hand by the opponent, by the way. Notice I have all the aces in my pocket aces in my range. I have ace queen. I have king queen. We have pocket tens. Maybe even queen ten suited every once in a while. This is a horribly played hand by the opponent. And if I did have ace king on this river, by the way, I would have just folded. Um, so, like, what's he trying to get called by here? It's a horribly played hand by the opponent. Horribly, horribly, horribly played. This was in a thousand dollar tournament, too. I remember it. Is it okay to slow play kings on king queen six? No, I probably just, um, I probably just bet. When you're multi way and the board's kind of coordinated with two high cards, just put your money in. All right, here I have the jack 10 offsuit, raise call. You can call or three bet, either one. We flat here because we're very deep. Check, check, bet, call. Um, pretty easy check call here. It's very easy for the initial raiser to just have a good hand. Also, the player on the button could very easily have a good hand. Now, probably not like sets and two pair, but ace, jack type stuff that may not fold. So I think we just want to call. We don't want to screw up our good odds. So easy call, I think. Whenever you're getting really good odds, even if you really lack showdown value, it's usually fine just to call and try to get there. No say alternative is to raise. If I raise and get re-raised, it's miserably bad. And there's no reason why this player cannot have a good hand. Now we get raised to 18 big blinds. This is a spot I think a lot of people screw up. I know they do because you all told me that you screw this spot up. This is a spot where we have a very easy call. A lot of people look at it and say, oh man, I got raised. I guess I have to make a fold. But understand we're drawing to the nuts here, right? <clears throat> we have jack 10. I know my head's up display is covering it up. You'll be all right. It's jack 10. Um, we have a draw to the literal nuts. And when this player raises me on the turn, his range is going to be, I'm, I'm sorry, on the flop, his range should be very good. This is a spot where you should almost never get raised by this player. So this guy's range, in my mind, should be literally ace-queen, ace-nine, queen-nine, pocket nines. Maybe, maybe something like jack-ten or king-ten of diamonds or king-jack of diamonds or something like that. But I don't know why I wouldn't just call all those. So this guy's range just has to be very good because he's raising into a very strong flop betting range, even though I know he bets smaller, so maybe he's a little bit more linear than normal. And the guy on the button here could just very easily have an ace that doesn't fold. So this guy's range should be very good. The razor should be very good. So if it's very good, I want to call because if he does happen to have that random two pair set or whatnot, he's going to pay me off when I, or whenever I do get there. So I do call, turns a queen, I check, he bets, easy fold now. So now if I get a king or an eight, there's no guarantee I win because he could obviously just have a set or queen nine, right? So now we, we have a very easy fold. So we basically, we have an implied odds hand. Church is trying to get there. Folds to me, we raise the queen six. This is something I've been doing a lot recently. I've been studying with some of the poker coaching coaches. And they love raising small blind and then uh, blasting off like a lunatic. <laughs> Fun stuff. So this is a scenario where we're raising three big blinds, understanding we're going to get called a decent amount of the time by the big blind, which I don't really love. It feels kind of dirty. But the idea is, yeah, we're going to get called a lot pre-flop, and we're actually going to get called a lot on the flop, but then we're just going to print equity on the turn in the river by blasting turn and river a lot of the time. You may say, don't you only want to be betting with draws? Yeah, typically. But whenever you are making this exploitative play, you're just going to end up taking all sorts of garbage and doing it. So we'll be making it four big blinds. So Alan, a big key to this play is keeping the opponent's range wide. When you make it four big blinds, that typically strengthens the opponent's range a little bit. Yes, you get more preflop fold equity, but this goal of the goal of this play is not really to get preflop fold equity. The goal of this play is to get turn and river fold equity where you're just going to make your opponent fold out way too often in a big pot. So in the past, I used a um, limping strategy, and it, it showed it was, it was very profitable, way more profitable than, you know, a lot of other options. Um, but I think this is just slightly more profitable. So, and I don't know. Not, not that it matters. I don't really have a big stamp. I'm not going to run. I was, I was going to look through the database, but it might screw up this. Um, maybe we'll do it later, if I remember. Uh, I'm pretty sure we went up making more money just by raising the three big blinds, like a lot more. All right, we flop, nothing. We bet flop. He's going to call a lot here, right? Notice he's going to call with any king, any nine, any eight, any draw. And that's a lot of his range. So we bet he calls. Turns a four. 
<sighs> well, past life Jonathan Little just always checks folds here, but we're like the Phoenix. So we bet nine big blinds. Keep going. We bet. He calls. We get to the river. So now, this is what we were playing for. Now, if he has a draw, some of which we lose to, he's going to fold for sure. If he has a nine, he's probably going to find a fold. If he has an eight, maybe find a fold, probably going to find a fold. So we're really only going to get called by a king here on the river. So what percentage of the range of the opponent's range is a king? And it's tough to say. But it's not going to be all that much. It's going to be 25, 30, 40 percent. So if the opponent literally calls with a king or better, that's going to be, I don't know, 30, 40 percent of his range, right? Which means he's folding way, way, way too much. In this scenario, if I pot it, he needs to defend half the time. So if I go up for a big bet, he needs to defend half the time against it? You think he's going to defend half the time? I just told you he has to call I mean, like middle pairs and whatnot. Do people call middle pairs for big bets here? I'm not sure. We like to go for the all-in, which you know, I think is pretty sweet. It's aggressive. Sometimes you're going to get hero called by some players. And this scenario needs to call a third of the time. So he basically has to call top pair every time and probably a little bit more than that. Um, and to be fair, top pair may not may be like less of his range than I even am assessing because perhaps he raises top pair on the flop, right? Or on the turn. Perhaps he three bets, ace, king, king, queen, king, jack, king, 10, pre-flop, right? Maybe king, nine, maybe king, eight, who knows? So I don't think the king is perhaps as even 30% of his range. So I think this is a pretty... Pretty nice spot to go for it. Let's see if he heroes me. He does not. He folds. We win the pot. And notice here, going back to what were we trying to accomplish here? Yes, this feels very risky, but notice the reward for this play is substantial, right? So instead of just like stealing the blind preflop and winning a big blind or two, we just won 15 big blinds from the opponent. Holy moly. You know how much we just printed here? We just printed so much money. This is how you get that EV big blind per 100 number through the roof. Hey, let's try it again. Same play. Three big blinds. He calls. Bet. He's going to call a lot. He calls. Turn. <laughs> Same story. Again, these hands are just like, I think these are in reverse chronological order. But uh, just a random selection of fun hands that I had. Um, I mean, yeah, we're going to keep going, right? Unless he has an eight, he's going to fold by the river, obviously. We bet. He calls. Do we put him in? Or do we bet less than all in? Seems like an easy all-in to me. We're trying to get him to fold out all the draws, trying to get him to fold a two, trying to get him to fold pocket fours. If he has a five, you might even fold. Um, this is the line I would love to take if I had the nuts. This guy's kind of tight too, seven slash four, which means he may not even have all that many eights in his preflop range. He probably just has something like ace four or ace three a lot, maybe ace two a lot, maybe pocket fours, those types of hands. And, and really, put yourself in the opponent's shoes, right? You're medium stages of a turn, or even on the first hand of the tournament, you're really trying to hero call it off when this guy just raises preflop, bets his turn, bet, bets flop, bets turn, jams river? No, you're going to fold a lot, right? So easy all in. They're going to call me eventually. I mean, I, I saved all the, all the reasonable ones. Sometimes we get caught. Do we bluff less on queen, queen two? Um, we should, but we're not. Ace eight. We raise preflop. One caller. Something else we've been trying to do is, again, just triple barreling off. This is a board that I think triple barreling is certainly reasonable. I was talking to one of the poker coaching coaches, and this is a spot where they said perhaps we should just check fold the flop, but if it goes check, check, then we bet turn and bet river. Essentially, anytime the opponent takes additional passive actions, they usually overfold a little bit on the next, well, on all, all the other, the, the future betting rounds. So I think the options here are to just triple it off to try to get ace king and you know pocket nines to fold by the river um or you know the alternative play which I'm, i haven't really experimented with is to check flop looking to check fold which feels kind of dirty to me and then bet turn and bet river anyway we bet you already know what we're doing here right easy turn bet now so look whenever the turn brings an overcard that nails your range you're going for it checking the turn would be a big mistake anytime it's an overcard that you could have go for it Go for it every time. Always make sure you set up stacks such that the river bed is not egregiously small. This might have actually been slightly too big on the turn, 7.63. I think I would have liked more like 6.5 because notice what happens on the, on the river. Um, pot's 26. He only has 21. I think if we bet a little bit smaller, just like one or two big blinds less, the pot would be 24 and he'd have 22 left, which I think would give us a little bit more fold equity. So river six is not great, but 
Backdoor spades get there, which I could obviously have. King is still there, which is close enough to the nuts. Um, if he has a 10, it's pretty unfortunate, right? So let's windmill it in there. Folds again. Sevens. Limp Jam. I think I remember this spot. It was the final table of a $600 buy-in tournament that we took a deep run in. We played some ridiculous hand in this one, I remember. <laughs> um, so look. Normally, you'd call the open jam for 10 big blinds, of course, but whenever there's this weird limp from T. Crames, who seems to be a good player, I looked him up. He's in the top, like, 20 in the world at the moment online. Doesn't have a lot of caches, but apparently he's very consistent. Um, I think he used to be a poker coaching coach as well back in the day. Well, float the turn coach back in the day. Could be wrong. Not entirely sure, but I think that's the case. Um, this is an easy fold. I mean, you got to think T. Crames' range is reasonably protected, given this is final table of a $600 tournament or something like that. This is just good, good medium stacks play, I think, where he can raise, he can limp and then call raises from the big stacks. He can limp and then call jams if he feels inclined. It's actually a chapter by Draft Ganger in my newest book, Excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em Games. It'll be out very soon. And um, he talks about playing the medium stack at a final table, basically do a whole lot of limping. Pretty neat stuff. I definitely am not well versed in that. I just raise a bunch. <laughs> anyway, we fold, we sidestep it. And beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. When you are limping, you're limping a um, some nut hands, right? Which is important to note. You're not just limping only nut hands. You're limping some nut hands and some hands that don't mind seeing the flop. So your limping range is protected. You're raising your medium strength hands, and you are limping the nuts and the almost good hands, like king nine suited and whatnot. Small blind limps. You can check or raise either one. He checks flop. Triple. I mean, look, I'm telling you, when they take passive actions, we've seen two passive actions so far. Limp, preflop, check, flop. When you give me two passive actions, we're doing it, okay? Again, this is not what Jonathan Little would have done even uh, a year ago, but we've been in the streets playing with the kids, and um, turns out you got to be willing to go for it. Just keep going. Just keep going. So do we jam river or not? Um, I don't love a river jam. I don't think we need to jam here. I think we can go a little bit less than jam. I did do jam, though. This is fine. I mean, he almost never has a flush, right? He has a whole lot of king x and 8x. King x probably folds every time. 8x definitely folds. Sure. We've been streaming all these sessions, by the way, as well. Some of them are in the, some of them are in the poker coaching classes tab. I think we're going to make a streaming tab because we're. I think we're going to bring on more and more private streamers. You all seem to really enjoy that type of content. I know it's a lot of content, but uh, you all seem to like private streaming, private streams. Faraz Jock has been doing it recently. Matt Affleck's doing it. Speaking of Draft Ganger, we may have him coming on soon. We'll see. He said he'll do it. Um, so that'll be cool. He was literally number one player in the world a year or two ago when he was grinding hardcore. He got rich, though, so now he, now he only grinds sometimes. That's how it goes. You, you, you come into all the money, you're like, okay, I don't need to play all day every day anymore. Turns out you got to play all day every day to be number one in the world. Mark says you think he's going to punt a bunch over the next few weeks. Yeah, exactly. Facing a min-raise, we'll call. Marginal flop. Check. Call. If we were shallower, I think we could get away with min-raising here. When you're shallow, you're supposed to check min-raise when you have the nut advantage a lot. Like, almost all of your range. But I think when we're deeper, calling's okay. Check, he bets again. So, this guy, Zhao Poker. Generally, just like good ish reg. I think he may bluff a little bit too much. So, um, yeah, I, I think calling here's okay. I think calling here's okay. I don't love it, but I think this is the type of thing against good players, against battling players that you need to do. You just can't fold too frequently. And if you fold too frequently, that's how they beat you. River's a six. I'll check fold this river, I think. But notice, he doesn't go for it, right? Check, check. Sometimes I lose. Sometimes I still lose here, but I think we win a lot of the time. This time we do. Let's see what he had. He had ace-king. Like, I don't even know why he's betting the turn, right? It makes literally no sense. Easy check on the turn. Any chance of making a video on how to use the hold manager? Poker tro PokerCoaching.com slash HUD, Larry. Also, check out the Alex Fitzgerald course. Uh, what's it called? There's some Alex Fitzgerald course, something like... I don't know. It's about heads-up display stats and how to use all that stuff. Literally in the courses tab at Poker Coaching. If he checks turn, does he call a river bet from you? 
Um, I would just check river. I would not value bet here. When you're out of position, you have to be very careful when it comes to value betting too thin. Typically out of position, you generally want to be somewhat polarized, I think. I don't know. You can go, you can go either way. It depends on the opponent. He probably uh, doesn't call on a six. A six is very bad for him because all the draws get there, right? On 8-8-5, six nails everything. So no, he probably doesn't. He shouldn't call. Here we have a raise. We can defend. Check. He bets flop. You know, funny enough, I was talking to Draft Andrew yesterday on Skype trying to line up his uh, stream, and he's talked about one thing he's been experimenting with is check min raising the flop a lot. And he thinks they fold out way too often. And this is something I've not experimented with at all. Yesterday in the $1,000 tournament, we made a deep run in. I just checked min raise. It's a stone air ball over cards in the $1,000 tournament, and the guy folded. He bet like 1.8 big blinds, and I checked min raise to 3.6 or whatever it is. And he folded, and I couldn't believe it. It was so happy. I laughed like a young child. <laughs> so anyway, what do we do here? <laughs> I actually think this is a reasonable min raise spot. I wouldn't have done this until yesterday. It's funny how you like you still learn, right? You study from the players who are doing all this node locking and player pool tendency stuff, and they find stuff that they just think prints equity because people fold too often. I think this is a min raise. Really don't get jammed on very often. I called though, which I think is fine. This obviously is a pretty good board for the opponent's range. Check call flop. Turns a five. This is an easy lead now. You have to think who has more fives in their range. I have way more fives in my range than the opponent, so I have a substantial nut advantage now. Play here is to bet small in the turn, jam river. And ideally he folds everything worse than a jack, which should be you know, a decent chunk of his range. So we're going to bet small on turn. He's going to call a lot. And then we're going to rip it in on the river for uh, 1.8x pot or something like that. He just folds, though. Pocket nines. 2.5 big blind raise from a tight guy. It's easy flat call because the guy's tight. You don't want to 3-bet against tight players who are opening from early position. He bets flop. Ugh, you don't like this because whoever he has has loads of equity, right? Like even ace-king and king-queen are fine. But if we raise, we're mostly going to get action from hands that are that have me in bad shape. Also, he may just rip it in sometimes with like ace-king, which would be terrible because I think you're supposed to fold if you raise here and he jams. We just call, though. Turns a 10. He checks. I bet medium. So... There's always a fine line between betting for value and betting for protection and betting as a bluff, right? Obviously, I'm not bluffing here, but can worse hands call me? And if you think about it, on 5-4-3, they actually can. If he's sitting here with ace-king or ace-queen or ace-jack, he should check call because he has loads of equity. He can't just fold. But I really don't want to let it go check-check because those hands actually do have a lot of equity. So I think we want to bet small to medium here. And then if he does call, we're just going to check back the river. Also notice we get value from a hand like sevens by betting the turn. And um, if he ever folds out an ace, it's just a fantastic result for me. So I, I like a small turn bet. He does just fold. And here, whatever he folded probably had some equity. I mean, I guess every once in a while he's sitting here with, what, 9-7 nine, nine, exactly? Or like even 8-7 has equity, right? Literally everything has equity besides, well, everything has equity. So this is a spot where I like the turn bet. I don't think we can get raised all that often. If we do get raised, it's clearly terrible. We have to fold. But I don't think people raise you all that often. Pocket sixes versus min raise under the gun. Easy call with all the pairs. This guy plays every pot, apparently. He bets flop. We're not going to fold to a guy who's playing every pot. He bets turn. Not going to fold to a guy who plays every pot. Check river. Is there any value in betting? Take a second. Ask yourself. I think the answer is definitely no. We have the best hand almost every time, but if we bet and get called, I think we're not going to love it. You may think ace I can call. Maybe it can. But if the guy is decent, he has to be very cautious with all of his pairs. And obviously, he's allowed to have pairs here. I mean, he definitely can have pocket nines, right? Why couldn't he have pocket nines? So I think it's just a check check. Maybe against guys with this insane of stats, maybe we are supposed to bet. But the problem is, is against guys with insane stats like this, every once in a while, they just check or jam you all in with air for fun, which is really bad. So I, I just like letting it go check check. He does have the ace. Maybe we missed a little bit. Who knows? Min rays. We can call or jam. Either play is fine. Um, this guy is active enough. Definitely active enough. Wow, look at our stats. They're very similar. Besides, I don't fold the big blind. We're 23-18, both of us. 43 steal, both of us. But then I just don't fold, and I three bet a lot. <laughs> um, we can go either way between call or jam. I think either play is acceptable. Check, check, flop. You got your barreling shoes on? Remember, check, check, flop. We are going for it. We bet turn, he calls, jam river. I, I know this looks like I cherry-picked hands I just won every time, but uh, maybe I have actually just won all these triples. 
Um, all right, ace line offsuit we raise, get a jam. So here you wanna ask how much equity we would need. It's just a pure math problem. So in this scenario, we gotta put in 13 to win, how much? Fif uh, 15 times two is 30 plus 2.5. Oh no, where'd everything go? All right, so 32.5, we have to put in 13 divided by 32.5 equals 40%. How does ace nine offsuit do against this guy's jamming range? This guy has 15 big blinds, so you gotta think he's gonna go pretty wide, right? Something like this, maybe? Maybe wider, who knows? Let's see how ace nine offsuit does against this, though. This is kinda tight. So against a kinda tight range, we have 43%. You already know if you're against a kinda tight range, you have 43%, you're just always calling. Because even if you like tighten it up a little bit, it's not gonna get like too horribly bad for you. Let's see. 40%, right? Against like super knit, we have 40%. So if he's wider than super knit, it's an easy call. So easy call here. There are a lot of spots like this where like, you don't love calling in the spot, but you're fine. Let's go a few, th few more hands and we'll pack it up. Here it goes. Raise, three bet small, four bet. This guy made it 10 big blinds. So two, four, 10. We have the ace and the king. <laughs> you don't see two, four, 10 all that often. I think it's an easy all-in. Don't fold ace-king. Yes, I understand we're against presumably decent ranges, but we have the ace and the king, and we're five betting, so we're even gonna get other ace-kings and whatnot to fold. It's easy all-in. Pocket sixes versus a raise, we'll flat. You wanna be flat calling with the small pairs a lot. I know some people um, just try to three bet a ton, and you know there's nothing wrong with three betting a lot, but the hands that especially want to see the flop, like really, really, really want to see the flop, are the small pairs. Because you see a flop, you make a set, you have the nuts, and if you don't have a small pair, you're fine. How many big blinds here do I jam? I don't know, 25, something like that. So more than 25, we flat, less than 25. I'm sorry, more than 25, we flat, less than 25, we shove. Unless the guy's tight. Funny enough, this guy is tight. Obviously, it's a small sample. But if this guy is this tight, maybe I flat call even with like, 20 big blinds, so definitely flat call more often as the opponent's tighter. He bets flop, we just call. Check, check, turn, no reason to bluff here. He's never folding an ace. He's probably not even folding um, like pocket kings. I'm not gonna try to bet the turn of the river to get the guy off pocket kings because he could just be sitting here like queen jack that we, can, we beat. Check, 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 obviously. Um, well, let's say obviously. He has the ace and the 10, right? So good no bluff, no reason to bluff, right? So whenever you're bluffing, ideally you wanna try to bluff your opponents off of kind of marginal hands and really, the thing is, is a lot, a lot of people look at a hand like pocket jacks here, and they just realize, yeah, it's not great, but it's a good preflop hand, so I don't fold. Even though it's clearly not a good hand at this point in the hand anymore. But this is a spot where a lot of people just drastically overvalue stuff like jacks. So, I, so we're not trying to bluff in this scenario. He should bet turn since he'd be able to bluff it. Yeah, he, he should probably just keep betting turn. But, I mean, whatever. People aren't good. Nobody's good on this poker site. All right, raise, call. Flat or three bet, one of the two. I think I like three betting here. About 10 big blinds. Um, maybe. So obviously the plan is to fold to Arnika if Arnika shoves. This is a spot where you want to take the best blocker hands that don't really play especially well post-flop and three-bet them. And that's going to be stuff like ace-x offsuit, king-x offsuit, etc. So this is a spot where you can three-bet sometimes. You definitely want to three-bet as the initial raiser is on the looser side, as we have here. Notice he's playing 31-20, right? So this is a fine spot to go for it. So get folds again. Oh my god, we just win every hand. Wonder how the EVB Bible Rounders high. We're just running hot. Everybody folds every time. Ooh, raise, call. I'm sorry, all, all in call. We have to put in five to win 20. So we need 25% equity. Do we have 25% equity? They both only have six big blinds, so they gotta both be kind of wide, right? First guy maybe goes something like this. This is first guy's range. What's second guy's range? Second second guy's range probably looks something something similar, but a little bit tighter, right? Second guy's range maybe is more like this. Sure, who knows? Evaluate, we have more than 25. We have 27 against tightish strategies. If they're looser, then obviously our equity is gonna go up. So I think this is a call. You don't love it. Obviously, you only win the pot 27% of the time or so, but we're going to be making a little bit of money by calling here. And uh, we do win. 
And notice here we had we had outs with the with the ace, which was great. Sometimes you're gonna be double dominated where you're just dead, but that doesn't happen too often. Raise the nines, minimum three bet call. It's kind of a bummer because I can't reopen the action. I don't think so. We have to just call. Eight eight four. He checks. Seems like a nice spot to bet. Small. He calls. Turns an eight. Checks again. Hmm. This is one of these spots where we have to ask: Can they call with worse? And you never really know. Some people do every time. Some people don't. I could definitely go either way between uh, checking and betting here. I do just bet medium to try to extract value. He does call. Rivers the jack. Check. Check now. He could just randomly have like ace jack or something. Ace four. Wow. All right. Well, didn't think he was going to be that wide, but there he is. This is okay. It's a bad spot for him on the turn. That's for sure. Small blind jams. Easy call. You don't love this spot, but this guy's going to be jamming decently wide. And I mean, ace three is not good, but it's acceptable. It's acceptable. Barely acceptable. All right. Three ways. Top pair, no kicker. Yuck. I think we just have to bet and get in here. Oh, I check. All right. Check's fine. This is a spot where like, we're not really susceptible to being outdrawn besides a four or a two. And even then, you're not all that scared of a four or two. So I get the reason to check. You definitely make your range look a little bit weaker, which is nice. You may induce some bluffs every once in a while. Now, look what we have. This is a nice reason to check, too. Now we have an easy fold, I believe, because we lose to all value ranges, right? We lose to all value hands, and the bluffs have loads of equity, like heart draws, right? So easy fold at this point. Pocket fives, all in. Got a call here. Fives are going to be in great shape. If this was twos, I think it's probably a fold. Threes, it's close, but still a call. Fives is slam dunk call. Get in against threes. We lose. It's fine. Raise from this character. Easy all in with the ace queen. I think we actually got through all the interesting ones. We lose again. <laughs> the fun, fun run out's coming, apparently. We'll go through one more hand. See what it is. I only pruned some of the hands. I, didn't, I got rid of a lot of the standard all-ins. Folds around to me, small blind, easy all-in, right? Uh, 20 big blinds deep. This is a nice spot to shove. We have a new uh, poker coaching app coming out in the near future that has preflop ranges, and I'm looking up right now. Let's see. 20 big blinds, small blind, raise first in. It says we have an easy all-in with the ace sign offsuit. It says go all-in with every hand, ace 10 and worse, ace x offsuit and worse. So we're jamming ace jack most of the time and worse offsuit. We're jamming king queen offsuit sometimes, king six offsuit sometimes, king four offsuit sometimes, fives, fours, threes, and twos, eight seven suited, ten seven suited, and some nine eight nine eight suited and eight seven suited. Everything else min raises or limps. So that's cool. Wish I could show you this image. Can't do it because it's on my phone. Anyway, I have nice nice monker solver chart here that shows exactly what to do. But anyway, ace x offsuit is a pure all in for twenty big blinds in the spot and guy folds. For those of you who want to dive deeper into all aspects of tournament poker for the next 30 days, I have something very exciting to share with you. We have our 30 day tournament preparation challenge. You can start the challenge right now for free. Go to pokercoaching.com slash tournament challenge.